Sports Talk with Player Agent 3. My next guest is a former UVA, University of Virginia sniper, one of the best shooters in ACC history, none other than Mr. Curtis Staples. How you, how you doing, man? Everything's great, man. I appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, no doubt, man. This is this is big time, especially for me, man. You know, I, I, I grew up in that area, in that era where you played uh, at UVA, you and uh, Jamal Robinson, Harold Dean, Junior Burrow. So, it, you know, it, it's some crazy times that we're living in right now, man. How, how, you know, with, with the, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matters, man, the, the, the COVID-19, man. How you holding up through all of this? Oh, man, it's definitely, I mean, I'm doing great. I appreciate you asking. But I definitely agree. It's just been, you know, very trying times, especially like you said, going through the whole uh, coronavirus thing and pretty much slowing down everything. I don't think anybody, well, I'm certain nobody had ever been used to anything like that. Uh, but then all of a sudden the chaos started again and uh, people kind of forgot about what we were going through before because it's been so chaotic with, with all of the protesting. But man, just prayer for you, man. It's just so uh, all this stuff will get better sooner than later. Right, right. So what I want to do, man, I want to go back to your to your high school high school days, man. You're you're a Virginia guy, born and raised um, in the state of uh, Virginia, and you you actually played at Oak Hill Academy. Um, I think it was your your last two years of high school. Um, Junior Burrow was on the show um, a couple of weeks ago, and he talked about his experience at Oak Hill. Can you talk about your experience playing at Oak Hill Academy? Yeah, well, actually, I played, um, I went to three different high schools in three years, actually. I went to public school in Roanoke, Virginia, a place called Patrick Henry High School, uh, as a freshman and a sophomore. Uh, won a state championship as a sophomore and just felt like I needed to be tested academically as well as, as, well as athletically. So uh, decided to go to prep school in which, at that time, I don't know if you remember George Lynch, who played at North Carolina, played at UNC. Uh, yeah. That's like my that's like my big brother. So he had actually uh, went to Flint Hill um, and played under Stu Vetter. And so he connected me with Stu Vetter. And I played at, at the time, Stu had moved his, uh, his, his program to St. John's at Prospect Hall in Frederick, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And so um, I actually went and played for Stu Vetter as a junior and uh, had a great, great junior year. Played on the super team, finished number five in the country. And, uh, and was just chasing that elusive national title. So I transferred again uh, to Oak Hill my senior years. They needed, uh, they, they had the best front court in the country and we had the best back court in the country at, Saint, at Prospect Call, myself and Tariq Turner, who ended up going to St. John's. So me and, me and Tariq, we, uh, we transferred to Oak Hill and, and actually ended up winning a national championship. So all that chasing worked in the end but it was definitely a different experience. I'm sure Junior explained a little bit about it. Yeah. Um, so how was it for you recruiting wise once you once you got to Oak Hill? You know, you know, being at Oak Hill is 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 the prominent um, school in America um, in terms of um, prep wise. How was recruiting for you? Well, I'd already kind of gotten used to it. You know, being in a top five program in the country the year before. I was used to seeing every head coach in the country sitting in the gym watching us work out. So I had gotten over that, that, that shock of coming from a school where I saw maybe a handful of coaches all year to all of a sudden seeing everybody. Uh, but the recruitment was very easy going because Coach Smith at Oak Hill, I mean, and same with Coach Vetter at Prospect Hall, they, they were veterans in the game. They had so many Division I players and they were, you know, they basically schooled us on, schooled us on what was going to happen. And um, it was a very easy going experience for me. Mm -hmm. And so why did you choose UVA? Is it because you're from the state of Virginia? Did you feel you feel at home? Um, what was the reason um, for, for, for choosing the, um, the Cavs? Well, originally, the honest truth behind that was that my father uh, told me that I needed to keep a state school in mind in my top five. And at that time, I wasn't considering going to Virginia. I was going to Carolina. Um, I loved Carolina growing up. I was all the way in. Um, you know, like I said, George Lynch, that was like my big brother. So it was almost a sealed deal up until Dean Smith came to my house on a home visit. And he told me that, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't start. I wouldn't play as a freshman. I had to sit behind Donald Williams, uh, which was understandable. Just, you know, two years before that, Donald, had, he was the uh, MVP of the Final Four. So 
um, I realized that it was a seniority rule at Carolina at the time, but when he said, you know, I've got a, I've got a few more McDonald's All-Americans sitting on the bench waiting their time as well, uh, it just kind of hurt me, man, because I really wanted to play as a freshman. And uh, coincidentally, Donald got hurt in his senior year and ended up not playing almost half the season. And they ended up starting a walk on a guy named Pierce Landry. So I would end up starting anyways, but you know, you never, you just can't predict those type of things. But originally I was going to Carolina. And then after that, that home visit, I decided to go ahead and take my visits in which I only got to Virginia. That was my actual first official visit. I ended up visiting Wake Forest, uh, but you know, I knew, I kind of knew at the end of my visit that they won me over there. So I, I had a good okay. feeling when I left. Now, now you, you talk about your, your your freshman year at UVA, man. You 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 played with some some heavy hitters, man. Like I said, you you, you got uh, Junior Burrow, you got Jamal Robinson, Harold Dean, and I always wondered, man, how how, how did you guys mesh together? You know, because all you guys were all stars. How, how how did you how did you guys make that work? That's a great question uh, because originally no one thought it was enough balls to go around. You know, especially when I was even on my visit, a lot of people were talking about how in the world is this going to work? You know, you got Dean. And then also you got to remember Corey Alexander, he was coming back. I mean, and so then you had Junior averaging, you know, 20, almost 20 shots a game. So it was, uh, I don't know how it worked, but it just worked. You know, it just worked. Everybody kind of conceded to a role. Um, Harold did his thing. Uh, ran the team after Corey got hurt. I became the outside threat for the team, coming off screens and uh, being a decoy for Junior, who absolutely dominated his senior year. And that's the reason why I got open so much is because they couldn't double Junior. You know, they double off of Junior, left me wide open. And so me and Junior were often on the same sides all the time. And uh, so they couldn't do that. But, and then Jamal, you know, who I still consider is probably the best all around athlete that ever went to UVA. Uh, he just was, he came in and just fit in spots wherever he needed to. If he needed to play the point, he did. If he needed to be on the wing at the shooting guard, he did that. If he needed to rebound and go post up sometimes, he, he just did everything. So we just, we just had a really good team that year. Mm -hmm. And you were known, man, you were known as, as a marksman at, at UVA. You set the um, NCAA record for three point field goals made. I think it was, was it 413? But yes. but here comes here comes along JJ Reddick at Duke, and you know he 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 break the record, man. Talk about number one setting the record, and then having someone like JJ Reddick come along and, and breaking the record. Well, you know setting that record originally when I came to Virginia was was something that um, I I didn't I didn't set a goal in to to do that. Um, but, and I also didn't think that I would shoot as many three-pointers as I did when I went to, to college because in high school, uh, my game was more mid-range and just getting all the way to the basket. I used to average three or four dunks a game and lobs and, and people that watched me play in college were like, wow, they, we never saw that. As a matter of fact, I only dunked maybe three or four times in my whole college career. So uh, with that being said, it started with that freshman year, having guys like Junior, uh, to be decoys for me to get open. And I was just finding a way, trying to find my role on that team. And it ended up being my identity in college, pretty much. Some of that I'm proud of, some of it I'm, some of it I'm not. Uh, but the part that I'm proud of is actually, like you said, setting those records and continuing to be uh, a really good three-point shooter, a great three-point shooter throughout my career. But I've always had good players in the post. After Junior graduated, Norman Nolan was there. Mm -hmm. And Norman was was an excellent, excellent big time guy as well. And so uh, he kind of played that exact same role the junior played, took over scoring inside. And I, I was always on his side so people couldn't double team. So, um, but then, you know, after college, uh, watching JJ come through, JJ's from Roanoke, Virginia, just like I am. So that was one of the things that was, you know, kind of ironic, you got some of the two of the best shooters to ever play college basketball came from the same city. And uh, that's kind of rare. So it was for me, passing that baton to him was just like, you know, giving him a pat on the back because he actually attended a camp where I, I was his coach um, uh, years but when he was a youngster. He came to a camp that I was a counselor at. So it was kind of like, man, you know, I watched this guy grow up and he, he goes on and has a great career also. So it was, it was all love, man.
What do you remember playing in the ACC back in those days, man? Because watching the ACC today versus when you guys played, man, it's 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 like it's like apples apples and oranges, man. It's it's, yeah. it's totally different, man. What what do you remember about playing in the ACC back back in those days? I just remember how tough the competition was, but you know you have to really watch. Uh, when you make that comment talking to uh, some of the young guys that play now because they swear that, you know, it's nothing better than their era. And I, and I respect that. Yeah. But I just remember our era, man. You're talking teams like Carolina with Rasheed Wallace, Stackhouse, McGinnis, even Vince uh, after they left, Vince Carter, Jameson. Those guys coming on. I mean, you think about Georgia Tech with Travis Best, James Forrest, uh, Maryland with just Johnny Rose. I mean, it was... You know, Joe Smith, the t every team had, they were stacked with pros, every team. And mm -hmm. it was, you know, back during those days, it wasn't any one and done. So you saw good basketball for, you know, at least a couple years, mm -hmm. uh, two or three years. And it was, if you could, if you could actually succeed in the ACC, you had no problems outside of the league. And that's what we saw. Right. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that you wanted to go to Carolina. My next question is, Take take me back to the first your first game at the Dean Dome, and then your first game at Cameron Indoor Stadium playing Duke. Take me back to, to those games, man. I mean, talk talk about. I'm sure there were the butterflies, man, and, and the sweaty palms. You know, honestly, every game before I got started was was kind of that way. I, I was like that even through my senior year. I just I don't know if it was it was if it was nerves. It was just anxious. Couldn't just couldn't. Uh, way to get started, but ironically against Carolina and Duke, with the exception of maybe one time at Duke, I averaged over 20-something a game against both of those teams for a career. And I always said Carolina, I think it was a little personal because I wanted to go there. So I just, I was like thinking to myself after every game, I, that 20, I did that 20-something, 20 that 26, 27, I just dropped. That was because I wanted to drop it on the other end, but I had to give it to them, man, because that's where I wanted to be. But I tell you, my freshman year at Carolina, uh, you know, I ended up coming in scoring double figures in the mid teens, mid to late teens as a freshman at in the Dean Dome, and that was that was big for me because uh, you know that crowd it was, which was kind of conservative, but still being in the Dean Dome as a freshman, 18 years old on the stage, national TV, uh, you know, it was an experience I still remember to this day. And the Duke experience is something that a Virginia fan will never forget because. We were down by 25 points on ABC um, against at Duke. They were crushing us. And uh, this is my freshman year. And I just remember our coach coming in the locker room and, you know, he just didn't say anything. He just was so mad. He said, you guys, it's bigger than basketball. It's about your families, uh, where you come from, your heart. Right now you're getting embarrassed on national TV. And I just remember uh, Junior Burrow, getting everybody together, Jason Williford, we all, and Corey Alexander, Corey was still playing at that time. And they just, we just came together and said, look, let's just ball. We ain't calling no plays. Corey said, I ain't calling no plays. Let's just ball. So everybody take their chance getting hot, you know, and I'll keep giving it to you till you get cold. And honestly, that's what we did. You know, Junior, Junior started getting hot inside. Corey started balling. I got on fire, Harold Dean caught on fire. All of us had like almost 20 um, I think Dean had 20, I had something like 18 or something like that. Corey had 20, June had 20. The game was like in the late 90s or early 100s in the score. And we came back and beat them and double overtime. And uh, that was just kind of one of those moments where I, I, I'll never forget it because the odds were stacked against us. And it was like a movie, man. All of a sudden the, the league kept getting cut shorter and shorter and shorter. And their fans got quieter and quieter and quieter. And you could hear our fans behind our bench. It sounded like it was our gym for a little while. And we ended up pulling it out, man. I never forget it. Yeah, was there a particular game that you can remember where, where it was like maybe your, 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 I don't know, your coming out party, so to speak? It, it was that game. It was that game. It was that game that I was just speaking of at Duke. Because that was the first time that I think, you know, people realized as a freshman that, you know, this kid is real. I had gotten a lot of hype coming out of Oak Hill, uh, but this was actually the first ACC game and it was on ABC. So, you know, you had Vital there, it was all hyped up. And then all of a sudden, 
you know, I start, you know, blowing up and 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 so people knew at that point this kid is for real. Do you feel like and and I've I've always wondered this, do you feel like you received the proper amount of respect as a basketball player at UVA? Um, I think um, you know, that's one of the things that I was I, I've been asked that question a lot. Um, I think if you go back and look at some of the careers that some of the players at Virginia had, and then you look at other schools, maybe like a Carolina or Duke, and you put those same numbers in a Duke or Carolina uniform, I think it's no doubt that the respect level or the amount of um, accolades and the things that was received would have been magnified. Um, I think it had a lot to do with the, the sports information department and uh, not that we didn't have a good one because we had a really great guy there. Um, but I think it just wasn't at that point, Virginia basketball had not been uh, put on a platform like it is now, um, like like the Carolinas and the Dukes. They just had more publicity just nationwide or even just East Coast wise. If you were walking to a grocery store or uh, a magazine stand, you saw more Carolina and Duke players than you did Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, now you go in there and look, it's different. You know, you see more Virginia guys on a lot of stuff because of the success and the changeover in that department. So, you know, I just attributed to during that time, you know, up until last year, we were the second best uh, basketball team, that 94-95 team that ever Virginia ever had, you know, getting that far, almost getting to the final for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Being a guy such as yourself, man, nice size, six foot three, man, could could shoot the cover off a of basketball, man. But you go undrafted in the in, in the nineteen ninety eight NBA draft. What what went through your mind? You know, having you know had the success that you had at UVA, that you know you you get to this point, yeah. but you don't get drafted. Well, you know that's another great question. I think um, it goes back to kind of the last question about. You know, if you have those same numbers, if you if, if I end up being uh, the NCAA all-time three-point leader, if I come out of Duke of Carolina, I, I have a hard time thinking that I wouldn't have gone first round regardless. Um, but, you know, draft night was different. I don't know if you remember, that was a year that the NBA strike was looming right behind that draft. Yeah. Uh, it was the first strike. And so there was a lot of things were really different. I had three or four teams that had um, committed to drafting me that night. Things got crazy in the first round. I, Chicago was one of the teams. And, um, you know, they didn't they didn't take me with their first pick. Um, and their early pick, they took somebody else. And then Houston was supposed to uh, take me. They ended up passing and taking a guy that backed me up on the USA team the year before. They took Bryce Drew from Valparaiso. And at that point, I was like, wow, I don't know what's going to happen, man. This thing's already crazy. I thought I would have been gone by then. Then at the end of the first round, um, they passed on me again and took uh, Corey Benjamin um, from, um, I guess, I forgot where Corey went, but they took him. And so it was kind of crazy going into the second round because I didn't think I would be there. And my agent was calling, telling me, we're going to do a deal uh, regardless with the Bulls because I think that's the team that you will make. Some of these other teams, I don't think you will make them and I don't want you getting drafted by a couple of these teams. And uh, one of the things I left out was in the late first round, San Antonio had considered drafting me and then they traded right before that. And so it was just, I saw the business side of the NBA that night and it was very disturbing because I thought mm -hmm. that I was definitely going to, you know, go in the late first worst case and I ended up signing a contract while the draft was going on um, with Chicago. And it, I, I just, you know, it hurt because I wanted to hear my, 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 my name called that night. I know my family wanted to hear that. So it was one of those deals where it was like, well, I'm, I signed a contract, a two-year contract, but I'm not going to hear my name called. So I just left the house the second round. I knew that they were going to block uh, any type of um, drafts. I know that Vancouver wanted to draft me and it was, it was blocked. Um, so, you know, it was it was rough to deal with, but you know, I still got a shot. But I still think to this day, if I come out of Carolina um, with the same accolades, I think I'm I'm locked in for at least three to four years. Do Do you feel like you were pigeonholed? Is 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 just some a guy that can shoot the basketball that can't put the ball on the floor, that can't create for 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 his teammates? Do you Do you think that was the knock on you? 
it was the knock. It was the knock, and I can understand why. Looking at the career that I ended up having, um, you know, I spent most of my time coming off of screens and and, and getting baskets like that. Um, but see, during that time, I mean, you know, nowadays, if I did that now, that's worth probably twenty million bucks. I mean, right. now the, the specialty guy came back to the table with the vengeance. Now they want guys like that. But um, I think for me, I did get labeled that way, but I also thought I addressed that label in the, in the uh, pre-draft camps. I mean, I, was, I went to Portsmouth back then and got MVP at Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. And I ran the point the entire time. Didn't lose a game, my team never lost. And I thought it was addressed at that time. As a matter of fact, I didn't even go to Chicago, didn't play in Chicago because my agent at the time felt like I didn't need to. So it was, it was, it was just a lot of, uh, you know, it was a mental roller coaster. It was up and down the whole time, just emotionally trying to figure out why this happened and why I still didn't get, you know, the credit I felt like I deserved. And then I ended up going to the Final Four, uh, participating in the college three-point contest and slam dunk competition. I was in the three-point contest. I didn't want to get in it because my agent was like, well, they might try to, if you don't win it, then it could hurt you because you're already the best right now. You've proven you're the best in college to ever do it. So if you go and have a bad night, some teams might think, you know, that that's just, I'm like, come on, man. I proved it for four years and not just one night won't mess it up. So he said, well, we'll go ahead and get in it. And I, I got in and then I won it, blew it, blew it away. And I'm thinking, okay, that definitely locks me in. It still did. So. It, you know, it, it takes me back, man, to guys like yourself, uh, Donald Williams, uh, Rodney Monroe, yeah. man. You all, all you guys had the similar skill set, man, but, you know, didn't really get that that real NBA chance, man. To It behooves me to this day, man, that you guys didn't get that opportunity to play uh to play on the NBA level for, for a long time. But you did get a chance to play in the NBA. Back then, it was the D-League. And you, yeah. you play you play some years over in Europe. Talk about the you know the experience that you had playing in the D League as well as playing across the water. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the, my clearly my best times were in Europe. You know, especially in Italy and in um, and, and Spain. I played a lot of places. Had a great career. Put up some great numbers um, and, and enjoyed it. So I, I'm glad. I, I I thank God for giving me an opportunity to have a professional career and playing somewhere for pay because when you're a baller like that you don't feel like you're, you're actually working you're just balling man and to be paid for it is just icing on the cake so uh, that was great as I started to conclude my professional career in which now that I look back on it I did it way too early I should have kept playing while I was at the height of my game but um, I, I said I'll give it one more chance of trying to get back to the league and I came back and got in the D league and you know, I didn't get called up. And so I just said, I'm not gonna keep chasing it. By that time I was involved in business myself. I had some stuff going major on my end. Um, and I just kind of, I retired early and I probably okay. again, should have never done that. Yeah, you, you, you <laughs> that's what I was going to, my next question was when, when did you know that it was time to hang it up? You know, I felt like it was time to hang it up when I had major success in the business that I owned. I had some huge success right off of, right off the bat. I owned a transportation company and, and a sports-based uh, company that did a lot of different things with camps and uh, all kinds of training and all kinds of stuff back before people were doing that. And so I just felt like, man, I mean, if I could do this without playing basketball, what's the point? I could still play, um, but you know, I'm, 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 I'm doing this right now, having great success. And so, plus I could be around my family. And, and so that was what, that was what kept me back. But I just, I was still playing at an extremely high level. And, uh, and every time I played, I always heard, man, why you ain't playing? Why you ain't playing somewhere? And I just, you know, I wish I'd have played at least for another five years. Okay. Now, now your former school, UVA, man, they, 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 they're back on the map. They actually won a national championship. Are you still close to the program or, or, or any of the coaches and players? Most definitely. I still keep up with all those guys. I, I know, uh, you know, Tony Bennett. Uh, well, Jason Williford was, you know, he was one. He's my teammate at UVA. My, my freshman year was his senior year. He started at the power forward spot for us. So we keep in contact and also you know, my, with my coaching career on the last over the last decade, you know, I've had over almost 40 guys that came through my my program to go Division One. So, 
Virginia has always been in my gym. So they've always been, um, you know, recruiting, uh, you know, players. And uh, I've always, you know, the times that I've had uh, available to go back and see games in person, I have, but I just haven't been able to because of those seasons kind of being around the same time. But I definitely follow them and keep up with those guys. Mm -hmm. I want I want to switch gears for for a few seconds, man. While I, while, while I got you on the show, um, in terms of you know the climate now here in America, man, and not just America, but man, but across the world. Um, you know, with 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 the the George Floyd um, situation, um, Black Black Lives Matter. George Floyd. What 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 do you think about when you hear that name? Well, I mean, I think about I guess what most people think about is it goes right to the the visual part of it, and just seeing that man being pinned down like that. I mean, I I feel really bad for his family and uh, and the people that loved him because that that is a visual thing i don't think when you say that um it goes my mind goes right to that that incident visually and it's, it's a bad sight mm -hmm. colin kaepernick you know you know i think more and more now people are are um, gaining more respect because he kind of he, he was the whistleblower so to speak in this whole deal um he was he was treated really bad and and, and probably i don't know if it'll change now be because of everything that's happened here recently, but being a whistleblower for for it, um, actually, you had some people on his side and some people against him, but now it makes him come out smelling like a rose because uh, this is exactly what he what he was kneeling for, and all of a sudden now it's uh, the whole country is is basically um, you know at a place where they understood what he was doing. All right, I got to ask you this question, man. You know, a lot of athletes uh, have been talking about it, and, and rightfully so due to the, uh, the the social climate right now. HBCUs versus PWIs, predominantly white institutions. What do you think about these top-tier athletes going to HBCUs? Well, you know, I don't, I really don't know what to think about it because I think that, it's hard for HBCUs to get those athletes based on the amount of exposure that they that athletes get. I mean, if you, again, just, let's just use a Carolina or a Virginia as an example, as opposed to, um, you know, uh, Winston-Salem State or uh, Virginia State or something like that. Um, even a Howard, um, you know, it, it's, they're not playing, you know, you, you're, playing on, you're playing on national TV just about every game. Uh, people, you become a household name based on your success level at those schools who have those huge deals. Conferences have those huge deals with TV markets. Um, I just think it's hard to compete, uh, you know, with, with with between the two. And I think that's going to be that's going to be the deciding factor for the players coming out. I don't think it's anything personal against it. It's just it's really all about the exposure. And athletes want to come out and be exposed so that they can try to have the best chance possible to have a great life after they're done playing and continuing mm -hmm. their career until they're done. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't know if you've been keeping up with some of the things uh, um, on the NBA level with uh, Kyrie Irving, yeah. um, Kevin Durant, and, and you know some of these other guys, Steven, Steven Jackson. Um, Kyrie uh, made a statement about NBA players starting their own league. What, 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 do, you, what do you think about that? You know, I don't. I really don't know what to think about that. I don't. I don't think that that's even feasible. Um, you know, I, I, that's maybe a, a pickup summer league or something like that. But I don't. I don't know. I understand Kyrie's um, his point he's trying to make, but I, I don't necessarily agree with that. And um, but you know, I do. I do respect those guys a lot and what they've done, their games and what they stand for by having a voice. Uh, I'm proud of Steve Jackson. Um, I've been knowing Steve for a long time, and he, he came from Oak Hill also. And, and Steve was actually my roommate when I was uh, playing for the Bulls um, in training camp. And so okay. uh, Steve has uh, become a very, very vocal guy now, and, and he's used his platform the right way. So I'm proud of him, man. But I, I don't I don't see players starting their own leagues working. I don't I don't mm -hmm. see that. What is Curtis Staples doing today? I'm coaching. I've been coaching for over a decade at uh, prep schools. I've been. I was at one one in Virginia for uh, for eight years, and I've been. I'm now in uh, East Tennessee, close to Knoxville, in a place called Lakeway Christian Academy. Uh, this is my third year. Just finished my third year out. 
um, I mean, I'm sorry, finished my second year out, going into my third year. And uh, I've had a, a great, great run so far, winning multiple championships in Virginia State Championships. And uh, my first year down here, down here in Tennessee, I won one right off the bat. I've had players go on to play at the next level. Uh, God has really blessed me and done some great things and uh, used me to be a vessel to get to kids at that point in their life, uh, that late teenage years, those late teenage years where they need guidance and, uh, and love basketball. So I've been able to keep it real with them and also push them and help them achieve their dreams and uh, moving on to the next level. Mm -hmm. Last question, um, Curtis. What would you say your, your, your biggest challenge was, man, in, during your basketball career? Just, you know, uh, staying on top. I mean, I think, you know, every year you've got somebody coming trying to get your playing time. That's one of the things that, especially, I mean, everywhere, whether it was college or the pros in Europe, you know, it doesn't matter what you did the year before. You have to, you know, be in a position that continues to stay on top. That was one of the things that kept me training and kept me working hard so that, you know, when I when I was playing, I was always on top. And I, I would say that would, that's definitely, that was definitely the biggest challenge. Okay. How can people find you? Any social media? No, I'm still in the dinosaur age with that, man. I I, I intentionally don't have it, but um, okay. people joke on me about that all the time, man. But, you know, I'm right now I'm kind of under the radar with all that stuff, man. Definitely. Okay. Well, I definitely appreciate you coming on the show, man. This is, uh, you know, this has been really big for me, man. You, Harold Dean, Jamal Robinson, man, Junior Burrow, man. It, it's been a pleasure talking to you guys, man, and reliving some of those UVA moments. Um, definitely want to try to get you back on the show, man, when this COVID-19 subsides and I can, you know, we can do something face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, yeah, definitely. But again, man, I appreciate it. Much success to you and your program, man, and, and hope to see you soon. Thanks. I appreciate it, man. I enjoyed it. All right, man. Sports Talk with Player Agent 3, Mr. Curtis Staples.